This week on Christian World News, bringing aid and comfort to a war zone as refugees flee their homes in northeast Syria. This compassionate team of relief workers is going in to help them. Plus, democracy protesters in Hong Kong get a huge show of support from half a world away. How is China reacting? And the Christian leaders who see God's hand at work there. And God's hostage, Andrew Brunson, spent two years in a Turkish prison. Now he's talking about the prayer movement that set him free and how it's sparking revival in the Muslim world. Welcome to Christian World News. I'm Gary Lane. The Turkish invasion of northern Syria created a humanitarian crisis. Syrians, Kurds, Christians, and Yazidis are all fleeing for their lives. Brave relief workers are facing the danger there to bring them help. CWN co-host George Thomas went with a team that's partnering with CBN's Operation Blessing to bring relief to thousands of families in northern Syria. This was the scene in Ras al Ain Wednesday as Turkish-backed jihadists made a new push to take control of the strategic town. I'm so old, I don't even remember how long I've lived there. Maybe 30, maybe 40 years. I cannot believe what's happening in my hometown. Some 300,000 Syrian Kurds have been on the move since Turkey's invasion last Wednesday, most escaping with little more than the clothes on their back. People in Syria are suffering a lot because the Americans sold us for half a pound and the Russians sold us as well. Why must the Kurds always be subject to genocide? CBN's Operation Blessing is partnering with Kurdish relief agency Barzani Charity Foundation to help thousands of families with essential supplies. Since yesterday, we have distributed 5,000 food parcels, 20,000 blankets, 5,000 hygiene kits, hundreds of thousands of liters of water, and baby formula with baby diapers. Within hours of Turkey's invasion, Barzani Charity Foundation initially thought about setting up two positions right on the Syrian-Iraqi border, thinking that all of these Syrian Kurds would come to the center looking for help. They didn't, so instead they decided to come right into the conflict zone and right here into Syria. In Hasaka, close to the conflict zone, all of the city's 40 schools are now shelters for those escaping the fighting. This week, Operation Blessing and Barzani Charity Foundation took urgent supplies to several of the schools. While the majority of the international NGOs have left, you came bringing your aid, and that gives me hope that there are people who still care for us. 30 semi-trucks filled with critical supplies made the dangerous journey close to northeast Syria's front lines, delivering much-needed relief and hope. Despite the risks, Barzani Charity Foundation says it will be the first of many such trips to the region. George is fresh out of Syria. He's now in Erbil in northern Iraq. He joins us. George, tell us what is it like for the people in the middle of the fighting right now? I mean, it's horrific. You know, I mean, these folks, are, the, the estimates are close to about 300,000 people have, uh, uh, they're on the move. They're fleeing the northeastern part of Syria in uh, in the last week. It's terrible. I mean, I met a, I met a, a gentleman who uh, said that his, uh, his home was destroyed uh, in a Turkish... Um, missile attack. Uh, there's a, a fierce fighting in uh, two, three key strategic uh, towns along the along the Turkish-Syrian uh, border that the Turks want possession of. They want complete control. But it's so difficult because, keep in mind, uh, Gary, this is a part of uh, Syria that is home to Kurds, Arabs, Christians, Yazidis, as you mentioned. Uh, and, and they have all lived in harmony where there's freedom of religion, freedom of spree, uh, speech, and, and there's peace. And suddenly the entire region has been turned. This part of northeast Syria has been turned upside down. And, and men, women, and children are... Uh, they're, 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 they're running for their lives, Gary. And George, you know that many of our viewers are concerned for the Christians there, many Assyrian churches in that area. What can you tell us about them? How are they doing? Yeah, I, I was just yesterday, less than 24 hours ago, I was in the town of uh, uh, Kamishli, uh, which is uh, probably about uh, uh, 25, less than 25 miles uh, from the uh, from the conflict zone. Uh, and we were passing through the, through the 
town uh, and a motor shell uh, landed. Uh, this is also a community. Uh, unfortunately, it uh, did not explode. Uh, but there is a large Christian population during the ISIS uh, onslaught. Uh, almost 50, 60 percent of the Christian population uh, left. They never came back. Uh, the remaining are now uh, are now leaving. It's not just in Kamishli. It's across this part. Again, you have to keep in mind since 2012, this place, the Kurds have managed to uh, create a semblance of peace and harmony, uh, where all of these various faith groups could live in peace and in harmony, uh, and there's religious freedom, there's the, the, the freedom to worship, the freedom not to worship. You're not, you won't get killed for becoming a Christian if you leave uh, Islam, and suddenly all of this is turned upside down because the Turks want to remove all presence of Kurds and other ethnic minorities from the, from the community, including Christians. And George, you were with some relief teams. They're bringing in aid. What's the reaction of the people when they see that people actually care about them? Yeah, in fact, one woman said uh, said to the Barzani Charity Foundation, uh, all the international aid agencies are pulling out because they're afraid uh, of what's happening. And here you are, you are brothers and sisters from neighboring Iraq, uh, Iraq, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, and they're coming in the middle of this conflict zone, and it so it just reminds them that somebody cares uh, for them. They were so thrilled that Operation Blessing was part of the uh, coordinated effort by the Barzani Charity Foundation, that in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of war, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, brothers and sisters from the region, from around the world are coming and, and lending a, a, a hand in the midst of their challenges with basic needs. I mean, we're talking basic needs. When you leave your home, all you have is the clothes on your back. You maybe carry a, suit, uh, carry a suitcase and important documents, but that's it. No, no, no memories, no pictures, no memorabilia, none of that, because you're just running uh, in many cases. And so to have these relief agencies come and help at such a time is a tremendous blessing and gives hope to the community. Yes, a major humanitarian crisis there, George. How should we pray then for this situation? Well, that, uh, that, uh, that there's a true ceasefire, uh, you know, and uh, that the United States, many folks that I've spoken to, uh, especially the Syrian Kurds, say they feel so abandoned. They just cannot believe. They're in total shock, uh, realizing that 11,000 to, 11, to 15,000 Syrian Kurds uh, lost their lives in the battle against ISIS. They were the foot soldiers uh, for the United States here on the ground. And to realize that once again they have been abandoned. There's a there's a Kurdish saying that I know, Gary, you are very well aware of that the only friends that the Kurds have are the mountains that surround this part uh, of the uh, of the of the region. And once again, they do feel betrayed. They feel like. Uh, uh, well when the greater powers are done with their uh, with their uh, uh, interests, uh, they drop them uh, like a bad habit. And unfortunately, I can tell you, and you know this, uh, there are going to be uh, uh, implications, ramifications for, for the actions the United States uh, has carried out here in this part of uh, northeast Syria. And there have been for many years there. And we'll be praying, George, as I know you will. Uh, for the people, the Kurds, the Assyrians, others in that area, Yazidis too. So, George Thomas, our senior international correspondent, stay safe. Thank you for your insights. You're welcome, Gary. Thanks. Well, coming up, a show of support. Hong Kong's democracy movement gets a big boost. Why Christians say God is at work during this dangerous time. Hello, this is Pat Robertson. The Bible tells us that there's great power in God's Word. Hearing, speaking, and obeying the Word of God will transform your life. That's why I've recorded the Transforming Word, Volume 3, Proverbs, Verses of Wisdom, Favor, and Anointing. The Transforming Word, Volume 3, will deepen your faith and help you discover the promises God has for you. I encourage you to listen to these verses often and say them aloud with me. You will find honor, guidance, favor, and the wonderful abiding presence of our Lord. Let the powerful Word of God transform your heart, mind, and life. Get the Transforming Word, Volume 3, Audio CD, and the Three Blessings DVD. Call now or go to CBN.com. I'm Ephraim Graham, and this is Studio 5. 
cruise with me as I discover the good things happening in the world of music, sports, television, and movies. The fact that Ryan Coogler was going to be directing the film, I knew that something special was going to happen. We'll chat with artists at the forefront of entertainment and explore the connection between popular culture and faith. I asked my pastor, I said, well, does that mean I'm supposed to be a preacher? He says, well, no, you already have a pulpit. Watch Studio 5, Wednesday night at 9.30. As the world watches from the outside. It's a big diplomatic tug of war here in the Middle East. Go inside the story with Jerusalem Dateline. Israeli archaeologists are talking about a discovery that could change the thinking about the Temple Mount. Join CBN Jerusalem Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell and get the biblical perspective on the events shaping the world. It's what starts in Israel then ends up going to other places. Watch Jerusalem Dateline Friday night at 9.30 on the CBN News Channel. Christians around the world are calling on Malaysia's government to explain the disappearance of a church leader missing for more than two years. Pastor Raymond Coe had been threatened for his Christian activities in that Muslim nation. Malaysia's Human Rights Commission says Pastor Raymond Coe was taken into custody by the special branch of police. The Voice of the Martyrs says this security video shows three black SUVs surrounding Coe's vehicle on the day that he disappeared. The car is forced to a stop and a team surrounds the car before they all drive away. Pastor Coe's family doesn't know if he's still alive. BOM launched a petition drive to press Malaysia's government for an explanation. Find out how you can sign the petition at our website at cbnnews.com. Well, Christians were forcibly removed from their government-approved church in China just minutes before it was demolished. The religious liberty magazine Bitter Winter reports the China's communist government suddenly marked it as illegal. It reports more than a thousand security officers carried out the raid on the True Jesus Church in the Henan province. Two elderly church members were injured in that raid. They had been taken to the hospital. Well, pro-democracy protesters got a big boost this week when the U.S. House of Representatives passed three bills supporting their movement, despite warnings from China. CBN's Asia correspondent Lucille Toulousen reports that these congressional actions are giving Hong Kong protesters hope. It's police tactics like this that have led to demands that urgent action be taken by the U.S. Congress to pass the Hong Kong Human Rights Act. At a Monday night rally in Hong Kong, more than 100,000 protesters shouted, pass the act. Now that the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act has been passed, they are rallying for the U.S. Senate to approve it to become a law. We hope the rally will show the uh, United States our stand for the freedom. If approved, the United States would impose penalties on Hong Kong and China officials who infringe upon basic freedoms in the city, including freezing their U.S.-based assets and being denied entry in the U.S. China condemns the bill and threatens to retaliate if the Hong Kong bill becomes a law. The Hong Kong government released a statement expressing its regret over the U.S. bill and warned foreign governments not to interfere in the territory's internal affairs. But pro-democracy activist Joshua Wong argues that the one country, two system agreement between Hong Kong and mainland China is a treaty registered with the United Nations, thus subjecting it to the scrutiny of the global community. We are one country, two system eroded to be one country, one and a half system. Members of the United Nations, of course, they must have a say on Hong Kong's autonomy. Violence has escalated in recent weeks. Widespread vandalism and destruction of properties by protesters, beatings and live round shootings by the police have led to an emergency ban of face masks, which triggered more anger among the protesters. It's been over 100 days since the protests began and the situation here is getting worse and it's becoming very dangerous. The question everybody is asking is how all this will end. Will the Hong Kong government be able to hold a peaceful and fair district council election in November, allowing opposition candidates like Joshua Wong to run? Always, Beijing say that they are willing to listen to the voice of young generation. But if our voice is not allowed to be heard in the institution, it just justifies how and why we still take to the street. Alvin Chan is a Hong Kong reporter who has covered almost all the protests. He believes that in the midst of the social unrest in his city, God is still in control.
there's uh, much greater power uh, over them. And this is God's love. Uh, what we should do as a Christian is keep faith and keep praying. I believe God um, reserve something very good in the future for us. Lucille Telusen, CBN News, Hong Kong. Coming up, Andrew Brunson endured two years in a Turkish prison. He talks about the struggles and moments of despair until he began to believe God had a plan for it all. It's about the competition. I kind of put that pressure on myself, and I think people had expectations. It's about overcoming. We use this phrase all the time, keep chopping, keep practicing hard. It's about going the distance. You know, I think as a father, it's my job, you know, to lead, just be the best husband and father I can be. Watch Going the Distance with Sean Brown Saturday night at 7.30 on the CBN News Channel. Orphans Promise is committed to loving and serving at-risk children, to helping keep families together, and to creating opportunities for strong and sustainable communities around the world. We're working in over 60 countries around the world, and with your help, we can do even more. There's an old African proverb I love that says, if you want to run fast, run alone. But if you want to run far, run together. At Orphan's Promise, we want to run far so we can touch the lives of as many orphaned and vulnerable children as possible. But we don't want to go alone. We're out to change the world, one child, one family, one community at a time. Will you join us? CBN presents The Transforming Word, Volume 3. Those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. The wise inherit honor. Take a journey through the book of Proverbs with Pat Robertson. In this dynamic audio CD, you'll learn biblical principles for gaining wisdom, favor, and anointing. Plus, as a special bonus, you'll receive a DVD of Pat's teaching, The Three Blessings. Call now to get The Transforming Word, Volume 3, and The Three Blessings today. Well, welcome back to Christian World News. Pastor Andrew Brunson was locked up in a Turkish prison for two years. The plight of this imprisoned missionary attracted worldwide attention as Christians around the world were praying and working for his release. Well, that happened one year ago in October 2018. Now, Pastor Brunson's written a book about his ordeal called God's Hostage, a true story of persecution, imprisonment, and perseverance. I recently sat down to talk with him about that experience, but first, we talked about the chaotic situation in northern Syria. Take a look. What do you think God is doing in all this? You know, whatever happened with those decisions, and I know many people disagree with it, I think our focus needs to be now on praying that God turn this around, because He can take terrible situations and mistakes that people make, and we make mistakes, and if we, if we pray into them and submit them to them, uh, then, then He can turn, bring something good out of it. So that's what I want right now, is not to focus so much on what already happened, as to what's going to happen, and how we can change that through prayer. Well, what should we be praying specifically right now, do you think? Well, first we would like uh, war to stop there, the hostilities to stop, the preservation of life, but we also, what we really want to see is a move of God among these people. And what we saw with the Kurds, uh, all, of the, all of the refugees when they, uh, because of the civil war in Syria, many of them came into Turkey, they were much more open uh, than, than other people are, than other Muslims are. And so this is driving it even more. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's even more difficult situation now that they're facing. And so we want this to, to lead to a breakthrough so that many, many people will turn to Jesus and ask questions that they haven't asked, that their ancestors have not asked for centuries. And so may God use us to bring, bring many of them to Himself. I've read the book, God's Hostage. You had some really dark moments, didn't you? I did, and I was actually, I, I couldn't have imagined that I would break so thoroughly 
and so many times, <laughs> but I did. In many biographies that I had read, uh, uh, Christian heroes, people who are my heroes, they are so strong when they go through difficulty. And I expected that I would have a similar experience to the things I'd read about. My expectations were different. And I felt uh, the silence of God. The silence of God in what was, was my darkest time. And so I was surprised at that. I expected an overwhelming sense of strength, even in difficulty, that I'd have joy, and that I'd feel grace, like a palpable sense of grace. And I did have grace, but I was mostly unaware of it. It was an unfelt grace. And so I felt at times betrayed, uh, forgotten by God. I struggled with suicide because I thought, I don't, I, I just want to escape uh, the situation of despair and, and uh, anxiety, fear, and what really changed in, the, in this area, I thought, I don't want to spend, I don't want to die in a Turkish prison and spend the rest of my life just wasting away in isolation. But then in the second year especially, there was a turn toward uh, saying, God, I want to complete the assignment you have for me. And so, I still didn't want to live the rest of my life in a Turkish prison. I would much rather be in heaven. But I was disciplining myself and trying to focus on saying, God, if you have an assignment for, if this prison time is an assignment, then I need to endure. I just need to push myself forward and hold on. So then I still had thoughts of suicide, but I very much fought against it. I fought against suicide because of what I was fighting positively for, which was submission and obedience and completing the assignment God gave me. So what do you want people to know about the persecuted church, the suffering church? There are so many, no one knows that they're suffering. Um, they may not have many people praying for them at all. Some of them don't have anybody praying for them because their families are against them as well. But they're famous in heaven and God so values what they're going through. I also came to appreciate that when we are willing to suffer for Jesus, this displays to everyone who is observing, it displays His worth, that He is worthy. We're willing to sacrifice for Him, and this is a very powerful testimony. I was so impressed with Pastor Brunson. He is a man who has admitted that, look, he wasn't strong, he was weak and his faith grew as time went on in prison. So, so very real. Uh, what a pleasure it was to talk to him again, and also his wife, Noreen. And you can watch Christian World News Online, send your favorite stories to family and friends, and you can find it on our CWN YouTube page as well. We'll be right back. From Washington, D.C., uncompromising stories, interviews, and analysis from veteran journalists David Brody, Escalating Fight, Jenna Browder, Post his words carefully, Ben Kennedy, Plan to join him, and Amber Strong. For impeachment, grows a little bit louder. Bringing you the political news that matters. We get out and tell the story of the progress that we're making in this country. Watch Faith Nation, weeknights at 6 on the CBN News Channel. On the home front. Thanks for joining us for CBN's On the Home Front, where we highlight what the men and women of America's military do to defend our country. CBN honors the men and women in our military with an initiative called Helping the Home Front. It partners with churches across the country to meet the needs of their military families, from repairing homes to wiping out medical bills for wounded veterans. On the Home Front, Tuesday morning at 10 30. The Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose walk is blameless. For he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Pat Robertson records this dynamic audio CD, The Transforming Word, Volume 3, available now. Meet the pastors who are preaching the gospel in a fresh, fearless way. Hi, 
I'm Roberto Torres Cedillo. Join me each week for Next Gen Voices. And watch God transform a generation. Thousands of Christians from every tribe and tongue came up to Jerusalem this week to celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacles. They sent a strong message. The nations stand with Israel. Emily Jones has that story and more from Jerusalem. Welcome to Jerusalem for this Inside Israel report where we tell you what's happening in Israel and the Middle East. Well, more than 5,000 Christian pilgrims from around the world descended upon Jerusalem this week for the International Christian Embassy's 40th Annual Feast of Tabernacles celebration. The festivities began with an outside concert and continued throughout the week in the Holy City. Thousands marched through the streets of Jerusalem to worship the God of Israel and stand with his people. There's something about Sukkot. It's a feast of joy. The Jewish people are commanded to have joy. They're also commanded to welcome the Gentiles. There's actually something in the spirit that accelerates the reconciliation between Christians and Jews during the Feast of Tabernacles. That is incredible. You sense it, you feel it, that joy, and it's the joy we're tasting is from the age to come. Organizers say Christians from more than 100 countries came for this year's celebration. For the first time in its history, Saudi Arabia is inviting Christians to come and tour historic sites in the country. The U.S.-based Christian travel company called Living Passages is hosting the tour and promises to give participants an up-close look at a controversial location believed by some Christians to be the real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia's new openness to tourism comes on the heels of a historic delegation of evangelical leaders to the country earlier this year. The Saudi Arabia of 18 years ago, the Saudi Arabia that, you know, out of which Osama bin Laden came, Al-Qaeda, and the radical theology of violent jihad, that Saudi Arabia doesn't exist anymore. They have made sweeping changes that most Americans, most Christians aren't aware of. The kingdom is hoping to increase international tourism with new museums, luxury hotels, and other attractions. Jews and Christians in Jerusalem are standing together in solidarity with the thousands of Northeast Syrian Christians suffering from Turkey's invasion. Israelis took to the streets of Jerusalem to protest the attack and call on Turkey to end the violence. It's a commitment, the Jewish commitment, not to stay silent, not to stand and just watch while something like genocide has been happening. An organization called the Jerusalemite Initiative also held a prayer vigil at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre to pray for the peace of Christians, Kurds, and other civilians defending themselves against Turkey's forces. Netanyahu also said Israel is prepared to send in humanitarian aid. You can see more stories just like this this week on our Jerusalem Dateline program. That's it. Thank you, Emily, and thank you for joining us this week. Truly amazing times we're living in. We're privileged to bring these stories to you. Until next week, goodbye and God bless you.